I just can't stop thinking about breathing in these days. My Buddhist friends remind me that to breathe consciously with intention is to live both physically and spiritually. And in the time of COVID, it just makes sense that we would be aware of breathing now more than ever. I wonder if perhaps awareness and gratitude for all things might possibly be one of the things that remains when this time of incubation is done. My mother used to talk about the great polio epidemic of the 1940s as though it had just happened yesterday. It had made such a tremendous impression upon her as a young person who worked serving patients and caring for them at Grace Hospital in Morganton, North Carolina. Her favorite patient was Martha Mason, who was stricken with polio when she was but 11 years old. Martha's 13-year-old brother, Gaston, died from polio, but Martha lived for 60 years paralyzed from the neck down. She lived for all of that time in an iron lung. The precious ventilators that we hear about on the news today are the modern replacements for old iron lungs. New ventilators are lighter, portable. They use positive pressure to force the air into the lungs. But Martha was never able to make the change to the modern equipment, for she said that after so many years of using the iron lung that her body was accustomed to its way of compressing the chest cavity and working more like the paralyzed diaphragm muscles would in a normal time and in a normal body, allowing the air to flow in through the individual's nose and mouth more naturally. She explained to me that the art and the science of breathing were absolutely essential to one's psychological and spiritual and physical well-being. As it turns out, there are way more ways to breathe than one might think. Breathing is mentioned at the very top of this scripture passage that we have for today. It is how the spirit of Jesus gets communicated to the first disciples. He breathes. It must have been a profound moment for them, locked in, locked up, locked down as they were, terrified, paralyzed after the crucifixion, and wondering what was next. Maybe like you and I are feeling on the worst of the worst of our bad days these days. And it is into the middle of this time of lockdown lock in, lock out of grief and pain for the first disciples where Jesus shows up. He shows up within and among them in spite of the closed doors and he shows up with this message, peace I give to you. As God sent me, so send I you and the story says, having said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, receive the Holy Breath. For the word spirit, of course, is pneuma in Greek and ruach in Hebrew, and it means both breath and spirit. And so I am in these days, rediscovering awareness of the breath. Awareness of the breath as spiritual practice. And I invite you 
to join me in that practice. Receive the holy breath. Receive the Holy Spirit. And as you repeat those words in your mind and as you breathe with intention and with awareness, they become a breath prayer, as it were. The words and the breathing will help your soul and your body to relax into the moment. This passage comes up in the lectionary on this particular week, the week after Easter. It's pretty familiar, this story. And perhaps when reading it in the past, what we might have noticed most is that it is about Thomas, the disciple who happened not to be locked in the room with the other disciples during the time when Jesus comes and breathes the holy breath, and so they don't have the same experience, all the other disciples and Thomas. And Thomas gets that unfortunate, undeserved moniker, doubting Thomas, when actually, for my money, I think he was just asking real questions. Questions that seem to be jumping out of the passage and jumping out in our time to a surreal and difficult time when we might indeed, along with Thomas, ask stories and questions and ponder the meaning of death and life and winter and spring and doubt, and disease, and health, and healing, and faith, and resurrection, and renewal after death. I wonder if these questions aren't at their roots about respiration. What if in the center of our isolation, and of whatever it is that you are experiencing during this pandemic, whether it is fear or sickness or worry or frenetic busyness in order to manage all of the other stressors in your life or boredom or loneliness or whether you're against all odds experiencing a renewed buoyancy and rest, what if... One of the things that you and I are meant to remember in the center of all of this is to remember to breathe. In the Thomas story, the first disciples' experience of the Holy Spirit is their awareness that the one who had breathed in Jesus who taught and healed and brought others to hope and life through forgiveness and compassion and love, now breathes in them. Now breathes in them. Receive the holy breath. And then when Thomas shows up, there is space for him to ask his questions. And then he takes it in, too. The holy breath. Because we are, no matter where we are, all in this together. Thomas touches the scars, puts his hand in the side and feels the breathing. He understands the miracles of breath in and out. After Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, he explains to the first disciples what breathing a holy breath 
looks like, what that means when it's demonstrated in real life. And it's this, he says, receive the Holy Spirit, breathe, and remember that whatever you forgive is forgiven. And whatever you hold on to and refuse to let go, that is retained. This holy breath empowers you to do that, to forgive or to withhold forgiveness. The choice is yours. And when we do either one of those things, there will be a different result, like having a paralyzed lung. If you and I refuse compassion or withhold forgiveness from ourselves or someone else, it is like having a paralyzed lung. We are truly locked down, locked in, locked out, and we cannot breathe the holy breath. In effect, some part of us dies, I think. Relationship with others dies. We can't breathe. We refuse possibility. We refuse the resurrection. For us, Christ is still dead. And it occurs to me that the spirit work of breathing is part, not a small part, a foundational part of our being born into this new life into which we are about to enter. Because, friends, I think it is clear the old life we used to know is dead. And we are about learning a new way to breathe from now on. It feels like an opportunity for intense awareness that can oxygenate body and soul. Spirit work that we can do while we're staying at home and washing our hands. We can do it. Now, breathing, except for that first breath, and our last one comes in pairs, in and out. And I think that's also true in spirit breathing to the soul life as well. Receive the holy inspiration. Take in the spirit of love and life and acceptance and forgiveness and compassion and empowerment and joy and healing and breathe out. Your worry, your fear, your resentment. Breathe in the holy breath that is your one wild, precious life. Breathe out to others. Healing, love, acceptance, forgiveness, empowerment, compassion. I really believe that the two parts of breathing are absolutely essential. Because I believe that in this time in which we are living, most people are doing their very best, including you, including me. And we, we need one another's compassion. The road may be very long and steep or shorter than we think. No doubt it will be very hard some days 
and it will also some days be full of beauty and the chances to see God showing up behind the locked doors and breathing in spite of the paralyzed lungs. Breathe. Whatever you release will be free and whatever you retain will be withheld. So do choose to be free and receive the Holy Spirit breath. When I went in to see her for the very first time, I thought Martha Mason surely was locked in, locked in her iron lung, and she was in so many ways. She writes poignantly in her book, Breath, that was published some years ago, that once her brother died and she herself became ill with polio, that she and her family never again sat together around their dining room table. In this life, friends, we just don't know when the last time will be the last time, do we? Physically, she traveled very little from her home and mostly only from hospital to hospital. By the time I met her first, when I took my parents to visit her, they were in their 80s. And my mom had not seen Martha for more than 50 years. Martha herself was in her 70s. She was completely supine, physically paralyzed still from the neck down, and yet in her life she earned degrees from two different universities, graduated first in her class, published her remarkable autobiography, which was reviewed by the likes of Reynolds Price and many other renowned authors as one of the finest reads of our time. She had a huge online presence via her voice-activated computer, and she had friends all over the world. She loved opera and philosophy and medicine and languages, religious studies, body jokes, and she had read more books than anyone I've ever known. She was unfailingly interested in other people, could converse with grace and erudition on any topic, and she lived her whole life as a world citizen, all in an iron lung in one room in Lattimore, North Carolina. And even though my mother told me that this would happen, and I totally didn't believe her, after five minutes of being in Martha's presence, I forgot about breathing. I forgot that Martha Mason was in an iron lung, even though it filled up the room. I didn't see it anymore because Martha was free. She spiritually breathed freely, which is what this scripture is about for us this year, I think. We could talk about the usual Doubting Thomas stuff, because I guess there are lots of people sinking in doubt this year. And on the worst days, of course, it is a logical place to land, as it seemed logical for Thomas in his days. Whoever quake isn't quaking inside in these days, some days, isn't paying attention. But it is essential for us to help ourselves and others in all the ways we can. And the first step, it seems to me, is to practice breathing in and out the holy breath of peace. If all we can do is breathe, then thank God we can breathe. It is not a small thing. The holy breath that Jesus gave his disciples, Jesus still gives to us. It is the breath of peace. And he gave it to them 
while they were still behind the locked doors in fear. So in these days, when deep breathing is more important than ever, do, my friends, remember to breathe in peace. Breathe out the fear. Breathe in the peace. Breathe out compassion. That is what resurrection is all about. Resurrection, after all, is about breathing. I invite you to join me in prayers. Let us pray. Spirit, we breathe with those who struggle to breathe in these days. We breathe in your blessed love and we breathe out your compassion. We invite your calming spirit in the midst of these times of doubt. And we thank you for the gift of breathing in and out. The holy, blessed breath. Amen.